I'm a 20-something female student at a pretty big university in the Midwest. I work as a desk clerk at one of the student libraries. I basically check books and equipment in and out, give directions for the building and area, and help the patrons with what they may need. I'm also quite talkative and friendly, and that makes me a good customer service employee, one that people will stop to chat with. I know all the regulars by name, and most of the people I see in the library are really great people. Most. One night around 9pm, another library employee, Mark, shows up to chat. He works in another department that has him walking all around the building, so he frequently passes my desk and says hi. I had a headache, so I really wasn't up for casual conversation. And knowing Mark pretty well, I told him that I wasn't feeling very well and was eager to get off of work soon. He wished me well and went off on his way. During this exchange, a patron had come up behind Mark to wait for my attention, which was normal considering I work at the front desk. As Mark leaves, the man steps up to take his place in front of my desk and just stares at me for a second with an uneasy smile on his face. I'd seen him a few times mulling around the library in recent weeks. He usually just sat in the cafe area reading a local paper. He looked to be about mid-thirties and wore pretty nice clothes, so I didn't think he was homeless or anything like that. He said he overheard that I wasn't feeling well and asked if I wanted him to grab me a drink from the vending machine down the hall as the cafe closed at eight. I politely declined obviously not wanting to take drinks of any kind from strangers. He seemed a little miffed, but didn't mention it. He then said he also overheard that I got off soon, and asked if I wanted him to walk me to my car. Becoming wary and alert, I again declined and started to consider my options for escape. The desk is only staffed by one person at a time on weeknights, and considering it's the spring semester, there are just not a lot of people around the library. With no co-workers to cover the desk for me, I can't leave. My boss works up on the second floor in the admin offices, but I know my favorite supervisor isn't working today. This meant I couldn't get a supervisor down here without a legitimate reason. Even if I call upstairs, I can't very well explain the situation over the phone because it's literally right next to me, and this guy would overhear everything. Who knows what he would have done? Not really sure what to do next, I turn around to hide the confusion and fear on my face. I stood and grabbed the disinfectant wipes and began wiping the counters, just to have a job to do rather than sit idly with this creep standing at my desk. I'd only been turned away from him for less than a minute when I heard keyboard clicks at my computer. I whirled around and see that he has my Facebook page open. He must have done some keyboard command to switch tabs, because my Facebook was open and logged in, but in a different tab when I left the computer. Now this is obviously very bad, because now this guy has my first and last name. Shit. At this point, I'm scared, but honestly, in the moment, I was just pissed off. I asked him what he was doing, as he turned the monitor at an angle so he could see the screen and was analyzing my profile. He then said, Oh, so your name is Abigail Watson. Nice to meet you. Obviously I couldn't lie and say it was someone else. I mean my profile picture is my face for Christ's sake. This shit really got to me. I told him how rude that was and how it was an invasion of privacy. He responded by saying it was on a public computer, so it was public property. Yeah, fucking right. He made a move toward me and leaned over the desk a bit and tried to grab my arm. I was about to start getting heated when Mark came down the stairs, saying he'd heard me from the stairwell. I must have been talking pretty loud at this point. I was visibly pissed, as Mark could see. As I explained that he'd try to buy me a drink and walk me to my car, and went as far as basically stealing my personal information from my Facebook page. Now also pissed at this point, Mark stepped right up into the guy's face. Mark's a pretty big, burly guy. He told him to forget my name, my face, 
and get the hell out of there. The creeper guy put his hands up and smirked as he took a few steps back with the old, Hey man, it's cool. I'm just trying to make some friends out here. I scoffed audibly. I told him I'd be calling building security if I saw him at my desk again. He told me to fuck off and called me ugly before storming off and leaving. Mark asked if I was okay. I asked him to cover the desk for a few minutes while I went up and explained what happened to my boss. He was also pretty pissed at this guy and told me he'd get security to look at the camera footage to maybe ID this creep and that he'd be banned if he showed up again. Turns out he was a student here a while back and had a history of stalking female students. Fucking gross. I haven't seen him since. I called campus police, but never really heard back. Mark now makes rounds to my desk when I work nights. Me, my sister and my mom have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday night, I was home alone while my family stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario is very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I'm used to the odd creaks and settling noises of our house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him. If anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the doors or windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12am were disconcerting, to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I am still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long. I finally got out of bed and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment, until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep. I saw the door open, about two or three inches. I froze. I'd let our dog Bosco out earlier that night but I know I closed the door. I've never left this door open. I'm a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like, so I would never, home alone, forget to close the door. I am 100% certain. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts, or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open, because I knew it would send me into a spiral possibly even an anxiety or panic attack, if I didn't explain it this way. I closed and locked the door, double-checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, I looked around the entire second floor of my three-floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease. And upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. As I was down there, trying to push away the fear. I could hear Bosco walking around the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2 a.m. the same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few times before this to Bosco in the basement, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in. 
We let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days. I forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. My sister and my mom were home with me for a movie night while my dad and brothers stayed at the cabin. I remembered the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again. The same door that was locked from the inside and had not opened since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she let Bosco out and forgot to close it, until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then this hypothetical person would be trapped up there now, knowing that this house was not empty, and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister in the bathroom, they ran out of the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I had found it, as though they were only in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, either way it ties too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing, or just breaking and entering many, many times. So it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this. I'm shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There is a part of me that doesn't believe it. But I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. Okay, so this happened about a year ago. I'm in a long distance relationship and I often fly to visit. I didn't have a ride arranged to come pick me up so I usually use Lyft or Uber to get to and from the airport. This particular ride started off fine. The guy was from Haiti, I believe he said, so he had a very thick accent that was often hard to understand. The beginning of the ride was him just making small talk like most drivers do. Where are you flying from? Are you in college? Do you have family here? And so on. We get on the freeway and there's lots of traffic, I had a layover flight and of course all the outlets were in use, so I couldn't charge my phone. I'm hoping this traffic lightens up because I really need to keep in contact with the people I'm going to be staying with. Of course with my luck, the app crashes and says, you have arrived. While we were literally in the middle of the freeway with no houses near us at all, I get kind of annoyed and the driver says he'll pull over at this Walmart nearby to figure out what's wrong. Apparently, he had a very old phone and it wasn't giving proper directions, so I said we could use mine, but I needed to charge it. He asked me to sit up front so it was easier, and I thought nothing of it, so I did go up front. He tells me he will take me the rest of the way for free without using the Lyft app. I put the address in and we're back on our way. As we're pulling out of the Walmart parking lot, he asks me how old I am. I told him I just turned 18, and that's when things got kind of weird. He seemed to lighten up at how young I was, which was a bit odd, but whatever. 
He then asks me a series of questions like, Why don't you live here in this state? You should move here. You could go to college here, so why don't you? I'm a doctor, and Lent is just a side job, so I have money. This man was at least in his mid-forties. I told him I had no money to just randomly move states and start college, seeing as I had just become a legal adult. He then told me, I can take care of you. I'll buy you a little apartment and a nice car, and take you out and pay for your college. I thought he was joking, so I kind of just awkwardly laughed and said that it's okay, he didn't need to do that. But he kept insisting, and I was getting kind of creeped out. I really didn't want to jump to conclusions. I thought maybe he's just not sure how to hold a proper conversation, being as he's not from the country or something. About 20 minutes later, we're about 5 minutes from my destination. My phone kept doing that annoying, charging, not charging, that phones do, when the charger wires are loose. I had this phone a while, so it did this at times, and apparently hadn't been charging much, and it died. Since we were so close to the destination though, I told him I knew the rest of the way, but I'd tell him to turn right, and he'd say okay, and purposely turn left or keep going straight. Anything but what I told him to do. Now we're lost because he's ignoring everything I'm saying, and playing it off as an accident. I'm not super familiar with the entire area, I only knew a small portion of the streets. He tells me he lives nearby, and I start getting really scared because I think he's going to kidnap me or something. I let out a single tear and then I tell myself to keep it together because in the movies, whenever they see fear, they get mad or something. So I'm trying to make it seem like I'm not losing my shit. Finally, he turns back around and when we're almost there again, he once more starts going the wrong way. At this point, I got my phone to about 5%. He reaches over while at a red light and grabs my phone. He rates himself 5 stars on Lyft and friends me on Facebook. He also puts his number in my phone and tells me to call him if I ever need anything and that we should go out sometime. I give a little fake smile so he doesn't know I'm about to shit myself from fear. Eventually I get so fed up, I just jump out at another red light and tell him, Thanks, but you're really scaring me. Bye. I call my boyfriend on my 5% battery life and tell him where I am because I'm really scared and I need him to pick me up. My Lyft driver is shouting out the window for me to get back into the car, but there's no way in hell I was going back in there to be some man's sugar baby that was also a total stranger at that. I go somewhere with lots of people and wait for my boyfriend. This whole ordeal made the ride last about two and a half hours. It should have taken 45 minutes, even with the traffic. Later I called Lyft and told them everything. He was supposedly fired, so that's good. I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night, I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail, so there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid-twenties walked by, carrying a fishing pole and small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came to say hi. I said hi and went back to reading, but then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy amused tone like, so you are just reading, and then looked behind me and noticed my tent and then said, oh, you are staying the night here alone, huh? It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark 
and just drilling into me. I just responded to him with, uh-huh, and yep. Yeah. I just tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks a beer and lights a cigarette, and then he starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wanders by, and he strikes up conversation with him. I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend to need to get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water really slowly. I saw the man walk away and go sit with a new guy, which made me feel really relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was watching the sunset and also loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent, he stood maybe about a foot away from my door, looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but just started laughing really creepily. I asked, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I felt sick to my stomach and finally responded with, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily laughed. Later I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name. Well, at least what was written on his cooler. I'd also overheard him say where he was from to the other hiker, so I put that down in my notes app on my phone, just in case. I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving the camp that night, but ended up staying and just leaving really early in the morning in case he came back. Normally, while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not that bad as you're hearing it, but this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the back country. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from that guy. This happened many years ago. I was eight or so at the time, and every day I would walk home from my elementary school. My house was a few miles down the road, so my mother thought it would be safe enough for me to walk by myself. It was a few months into the school year when it started happening. A beat-up Toyota would slow down enough for a couple of white guys that looked like they were in their mid-twenties to follow me and yell insults at me. I was chubby back then, so they would call me fat and much more hurtful things. I'll always remember the driver. He looked to be the oldest in the bunch with greasy blonde hair hanging down and partially covering his pimpled, scarred face. They would follow me until I reached the gas station that was halfway along my journey home. Then they would speed off, laughing loudly. For the first couple of weeks, I didn't tell anyone, thinking they would get tired of it. They didn't. A full month passed before I told my mother about it. She, of course, was rightly concerned about me and asked me how long it had been going on for. When I told her a month, she grew even more concerned. Her, being a single mom, couldn't pick me up from school because she was at work all day, so her solution was to send my older brother to meet me halfway. She thought it would deter them. It didn't. Another four months went by with them continuing to follow me and throw insults at me. Then suddenly it stopped. A whole month went by without them driving by, and we thought everything was safe again. We were wrong. Suddenly, out of the blue, I saw the old beat-up Toyota heading down the road towards me. Only the driver was in the car this time. He slowed down, flung open the passenger door, and proceeded to yell for me to get into the car. I was so scared I couldn't even speak. I just shook my head no and tried to walk faster. He continued to follow me, demanding that I get into his car. I'll never forget the look on his face as he yelled at me. It was so full of rage. We finally got to the gas station and I made a break for it. 
I ran inside the gas station and up to the gas station attendant. I told him what was happening and he let me hide behind the counter. The driver pulled into the gas station, hopped out of the car and came in. He demanded that the gas station attendant tell him where I was, claiming I was his daughter and I jumped out of his car. The gas station attendant glanced down at me and I shook my head wildly mouthing that I did not know this man. The gas station attendant said he didn't know what he was talking about and that he had to leave the store immediately. The driver began to yell wildly and start walking around the store looking for me. The gas station attendant said he was going to call the police if he did not leave. The man turned to him and said something I'll never forget. I'll get that bitch one way or another. The driver stormed out of the gas station and left. I sat there on the floor crying for what felt like hours. The gas station attendant called the police and had them come over. When the police arrived, the attendant told them what had happened. A police officer knelt down beside me and asked me my side of the story. I told the officer everything. How him and a couple of others had been following me for months. How they would follow me and insult me. How they suddenly stopped. And how he tried to get me into his car. I don't remember much afterwards other than them calling my mother and her meeting at our house. They took my mother's statement and then left. After that... My mother changed her work hours in order to come get me every day. For years I lived in fear that the man with greasy hair and pimple-scarred face would eventually get me. So, to the man who followed me for months, insulting me and eventually trying to get me into his car, I'm not that scared little girl anymore. We better never meet. So, I moved into this place a couple of months ago with my parents. We also have a dog. A couple of weeks after we moved in, I tried to open the attic door. There was no ladder. Just with a broom, it almost opened and halfway dropped, but it seemed like it was being held up by someone. I didn't bother and thought it could have just been stuck. Two weeks later, I go back to look at the attic, and the door is in the spot that it was originally in. Weird, I thought. A month or so later, my dog usually doesn't have problems with me and my family leave the house. But now there's something up with my dog. She will hide under the table and start to panic. At night, I usually hear footsteps and loud bangs sometimes. My parents are deep sleepers and don't wake up during the night, so I know it's not them. When I wake up, I go to check out the loud bangs but nothing has fallen. I don't know if I'm going crazy or I'm just nervous. I went around my house checking any closets and crawl spaces. I didn't find anything. After that, I went to try to open the attic door, but it seems like it's been boarded up, like shut from the inside. It could have been the old owners, or there is someone in my attic. I decided to call the police. They sent out some officers to check it out. Upon inspecting the attic, the police found a sleeping bag and a ton of boxes full of stuff, but they didn't find anyone. I'm thinking it could have been the old owner's stuff, or at some point, there was someone in my attic. I'm really shocked, but comforted that there's nobody currently in my attic. My parents and I are going to board up the attic to make sure nothing like this happens again. I moved out of state to a very small town. The first day of moving in, a neighbor walking his dog greets me and introduces himself to me. He gives me a quick rundown that the neighborhood is filled with tweakers and other shady types. I took that as a general warning that that may be all I'll deal with. A few months later, he invited me over to his place to teach me how to do some woodwork as we're making a shelf for my cat to sit on. He's asking me questions. 
To me, they were normal everyday questions, but looking back, I realize now he was trying to get information out of me. Why did you move out here from out of state? Who lives with you? Do you have any other family members in the state or area? Once we were done, we went to install the shelf, and he met my mom who stays with me. He talks to her for a bit, and then we left to walk back to his place. He starts telling me that he can see our yard from his place, and notices that I barely go outside with my dogs. He told me not to worry that if someone breaks into our place, that he can see them and shoot them from his room. That's what I'm thinking. How is that possible? Because you live over half a block away. Before I can question him, he asks if I want to see more of the town. I'm like, yeah, let's go. He walks out to his car and pulls something out from the middle compartment, and then tells me to go in his pickup truck. So I do, while he's filling the gas tank up with some gasoline. Once he's done, he walks over to the driver's side and opens the door. He drops a holster between us. He tells me not to worry about it as I look, trying to see if there's a gun or not. As we're driving, I realized he hasn't said a word for five minutes, and this guy loves to hear his own voice. Another thing I noticed is that we're on a dirt road, and I haven't seen a single house, trailer, or vehicle for a while. I guess I gave off some nervous vibes because he suddenly says, So yeah, unless you know where you're going out here, you'll get lost, and it's best to have a pickup or ATV to drive out here. After about another 10 minutes of silent driving, we get to a little creek. Luckily there was another truck there. All he says is, Oh, look at that. Someone else is here with us. And he grabs his holster and gets out. We both see a lady with a big dog playing in the water. She turns to us as she sees him walking closer to her. She gestures to his holster and he tells her not to worry, that it's for the snakes. She lifts her shirt above her waist to show her gun, and she tells him she's not worried one bit. They talk for a few minutes, and she tells him that her husband is home waiting for her to make dinner. She's just out letting the dog have some playtime. The neighbor changes his tone and posture from confident to defensive now. She called her dog, and they went to their truck. He's watching her, and she hasn't started her truck yet. A few minutes pass and he tells me it's time to go too. When we get to his truck, she drives off. The drive back, I start to get uneasy and creeped out. Why would he drive me all the way out there and just leave? Why tell me not to worry about the holstered gun, but tell the lady what it's for? I finally get out of my head and just break the silence and give him my life story as to why I moved. Finally, he responds that he can relate to my story and gives me a rundown of how the town is and what it's about, and that some people are more racist than others, and I should watch my back for that. Once we get back to his place, I tell him I have stuff to take care of at home, and I nope the hell out of there. I said to myself, if I'm ever gonna hang out with him again, it won't be alone. I'm an 18 year old kid in culinary school. This happened back in 2009. Our program has an underground parking lot attached to a lounge of our own, located behind the cafeteria. Couples like going there because it's always empty and partially dark. I hated it because it had a back door leading to the parking lot that was barely lit up. Barely anyone parked there, and so I found it creepy. Plus being a horror fan, I knew that that was a perfect opportunity for things to go wrong. Long story short, I come out of class one day and this kid I don't know starts walking up to me, almost confrontational like. I have my knife set with me and pull out a handle, readying to defend myself. He stops and hands me a paper. It reads, meet me in the lounge. I look at him in confusion and ask who sent him the note. Was it my boyfriend, or someone in the culinary program, or maybe a friend from high school? 
He shakes his head and says he doesn't know, but I should go. I question him on what this person looks like, and he refuses to give me any information. I chuckle nervously, put the note in my pocket, and walk past this kid to head to class. He starts following me, asking me if I'm gonna go. I try ignoring him, heading towards the library to get into a public place. He follows. He tries telling me I should go, that it's my destiny or some shit along those lines. I glare at him and pick up the pace, trying to head downstairs to the cafeteria in hopes of finding a classmate and losing the kid. He runs at the same pace, telling me he doesn't understand why I'm not going. I tell him, because I don't want to, now go away, and I head into the cafeteria. By now, he's really creeping me out. I grab for my phone to call the police, but instead see a classmate and run towards him. The kid follows me, pointing towards where the lounge is and telling me I'm going the wrong way. I instantly panic and tell my classmate what's going on. He approaches the kid and tells him to leave me alone, that I have a boyfriend and I'm not interested. The kid tells me that they're waiting for me in the lounge and not to take too long. His words just gave me chills. My classmate walks me to our student restaurant and asks for some others to come with us. Three of my other colleagues come with us to the lounge. There's no one there. I get freaked out and decide I need to go home. They walk me through the campus to the parking lot where I can call my parents to get a ride. One of the others stays with me while the classmate who defended me goes to report the behavior to our teachers, who use the lounge as a secondary office sometimes. He then comes back to tell me that they're going to investigate and keep an eye out for suspicious activity, or that kid. A few days later, I learned that a girl had been assaulted in that area, having parked there during finals and gone in through the lounge. The school newspaper had reported it, but there were no details as to who did it to her, and if they were caught. I felt my stomach drop, hoping that the girl was okay, and hoping that those people get caught. I reported my incident to the newspaper team, but they claimed she never dealt with anything like a note. They never found the suspects. My mom is glad I listened to my gut and did not go. To this day, I still get chills thinking about it. The girl recovered and escaped with a few minor injuries. They never caught the attackers, and I never saw that strange kid again. All I can think of is, why me? If they were going for money, I was so poor I literally lived off sesame crackers donated by classmates because I had no money. I'm just glad the girl is okay, and that I listened to my gut. Who knows what would have happened if... I go. This happened back in the 90s when I was still in primary school. I really had no clue how much danger I was in. I would have been around 11 years old, living in a regional city of Australia. For the last year, I'd been having a lot of trouble at school, getting bullied a bit by classmates, and felt really singled out by my teacher. My mom worked around the corner from my school, so when everything would get too much at school, I would literally just walk out of class, down the road, and onto her work site. It would take me about half an hour to walk there, along a main road. A couple of times I noticed a small white car driving past me slowly. But I only noticed this because I would see the same car go up and down the street as I was walking, and while I was sitting outside of my mom's work site. After a while, I started seeing the same car driving up my street at home and parked along the streets that my brother and I would ride our bikes around in. I don't remember thinking it was strange, because it was a small town and it wasn't unusual to see the same cars or people. It was just like, Oh, there goes that car again. Anyway, my family followed a serious routine. Mondays swimming and tutoring. 
Tuesdays, netball training. Wednesdays, netball game. Thursdays, basketball training. Fridays, we would go and see professional basketball or football, depending on the season. Saturday was my brother's basketball games. And Sundays were our day to go to the river with friends for swimming and a barbecue lunch. It never changed unless someone was sick. So one Friday night, I'm getting dressed and ready to go watch the basketball game, but I can't find my shoes. I'm pretty sure that they're in the car which is in a garage under our two-story house. To get it, I would have to walk down the outside steps at the front of the house, which has a full view of the road. I walk out the front door, and at the end of our driveway is a small, white car. Now, I've never taken that much notice of the white cars up until this point, and it wasn't uncommon for cars to be parked in this exact spot for our neighbors, but I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach when I looked at it. I kept walking down the stairs, and as I got close to the bottom, the driver's side door opens, and the man gets out quickly. I keep walking to the garage, and he starts moving toward our driveway. That was the point when something inside me just told me to scream for my parents and run and lock myself in the car. I did exactly that, and then this guy turned around ran back to his car and drove off. By the time my parents came out, there was no evidence that this had happened, and they didn't believe me. A week later, there was a notice in our school newsletter about a man in a white car attempting to abduct another child from my school on the same night. My parents were very shaken and took me seriously after reading that. I don't believe he was ever caught but it definitely taught me to listen to my intuition and to take notice of my surroundings. My family and I went on a trip to the Hawking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I've never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving and it's, for lack of better words, real impoverished where we are driving. Hills have eyes ask. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest and we're close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For a bit of additional information, I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have and have my husband in the car. I also have my 10-year-old nonverbal autistic son and my 6-year-old daughter. We drive down this real creepy stone road into the forest and there's nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. We see signs that were close and pull into the parking lot. We walk over the footbridge and make our way toward the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel toward us while we're on foot. The man gets out of the truck with a chainsaw. It's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I try to make small talk with him and get some information, things like if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources and that kind of thing, but he really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using the chainsaw behind us. The sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service and literally no one knows my family is out there except for us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people, like we have money or something, which we don't. We rush to the car to get the kids in their booster seats, and this man comes driving over the footbridge in his truck toward us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fit on it. He stops again, gets out of his truck, and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, 
and we compared his hands and my son's. They were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. We get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us. And there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us like that. There's nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he's there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road and into the ravine in the woods. Finally we get out of the woods, and it turns out he's still following us. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go past the stone road that goes to the forest. There's one lone house near this road, and there is his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods, and taken a back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. This is a story from 2019, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I guess due to trauma. I was bored at home alone. I FaceTimed with my best friend and asked him if he would like to join me for a walk in the neighborhood. He wasn't there. He was on his way back from school, which is understandable, because it was a Thursday afternoon. Due to my massive boredom, I put on my sports clothes, a basic t-shirt, and some shorts that have no pockets. I then was headed with my music, vibing to the circuit. Arriving there, it was surprisingly not that empty. There were around 8-10 to 10 people in that 15 kilometer circuit. I started walking for a bit, then ran for a couple of kilometers, and then laid down in the grass. I noticed two guys on a motorcycle going back and forth. I didn't care that much since I was facetiming my two best friends. It was getting late, I think it was around 6pm, and I was exhausted. I walked home, but I took another path that's kind of a shortcut. I had to walk through an empty big street with buildings and construction. I had a feeling that someone was watching me and following me. I turned around and noticed the same two guys on that motorcycle heading toward me. I whispered to my friends on FaceTime that something weird's going to happen and that they have to cut their mics and focus with me. The guys came by and one of them asked me where the nearest barbershop is. Out of stress, I gave them a random location. While the rider of the bike asked me about the barbershop, my right eye twitched and unfocused, but I was still able to see with it. I saw in the bike's rearview mirror that the other guy was trying to look at where my phone was located. I was freaking out. Time was starting to slow down. Seconds felt like hours and I couldn't feel my legs anymore. They went on, but with a slow speed. It was like they were planning a backup plan. I had three options. Number one, there was a taxi guy fixing his car. I could have went to him and explained the situation, but my gut said what if they noticed me, came back, and maybe do what they planned to do. Number two, stop a random car, hop in, and then explain the situation. My gut said no, what if the car was locked? Plus the guys would have noticed that I knew they were planning to do something, and they might have come to me after the random car goes. And number three, this is what I chose. Run in the opposite direction into traffic and take the path that I came by. I instinctively ran for five straight minutes. I couldn't do it anymore. I entered a field and started running again to some slums. I looked back and I saw the guys coming after me into the field. One of them was shouting, Just stop. We just want to know where the barbershop is. There's one thing about me, and it's that I always trust my gut. And it's sad. No, run as fast as you can, or you will die today. And that's what I did. I ran between the slums and kept running until I arrived near my best friend's house. I told him to come down the stairs right now, and I laid down in the parking lot. He came to me and was freaked out because he knew that something was happening. 
but he didn't know what since I didn't give him more information. My face turned yellowish and I threw up. I couldn't feel my legs or my arms anymore. He walked me to my house and I laid down, and from that moment, I don't remember anything. I just remember me waking up the following day with bruises on my leg due to me running in the field full of pikes. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. I want to say a big thank you to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these crazy dating stories. If you haven't already, check out his channel for more stories straight from Japan. He translates them so you probably haven't heard them before. You can find the link to his channel in the description below. If you can't get enough Mr. Revenant content, check out the perks of my Patreon and channel membership. Details are in the description. I want to say a special thanks to those already supporting the channel. So huge thanks to Sarah C, Brenda, Sharon and Ashley, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Cow, K, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey, Sarah T, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Astara Rain, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you all for listening, guys. I'll see you in the next one.